I want to talk today about how we would use ERDOS Imagine to order and then exploit displacement data based on uh, interferometric SAR time series analysis. Now, I have here on my Imagine screen a radar image and a map. It wouldn't have to be a radar image, it could be an optical image. So I would then use my tools to indicate my area of interest. I know there's an aquifer here that's experiencing some subsidence. I want to have an analysis of this to see how extensive it is. Once I've selected my area, I would go to my radar utilities and select the service request form. That would bring up this GUI here. Just by clicking this AOI box, I can automatically transfer this AOI, my area of interest, into my GUI. I would say that I'm interested in aquifer monitoring, and I would then have to provide name, contact information, and any sort of comments I want to add in having an analysis done on the, pos the feasibility of doing a study in this area. Once I'd populated this and I was ready to forward it, I just click OK, and it takes this information and puts it into an email which is then sent to our sales operation folks. They will look at your area of interest, make sure data is available, make sure that the study you want to do is a feasible thing to do in your area, and then contact you for a price quote, discuss things like, do you want just a one-time study? Do you want to get a report every three months, every six months? What exactly, what sort of contract do you want to put together here for your study? This would then be sent off for that analysis and you would get an answer back. Uh, once an agreement was made and the analysis was done, your data would be posted to a website where you could access it. Once your scenes have been acquired and processed into the substance information, it would be posted for you on a dedicated website with a bunch of exploitation tools. We're looking at that here. This is coming uh, directly from the service provider and, uh, on their cloud. It's always stored there. You always have access to it. You can see here that I have a number of areas for my particular studies, but the Arizona McMullen is the aquifer area we're looking at here. These are the subsidence points, of course, downsampled in order to cover this entire area. We'll zoom in in a minute. But these points are all color-coded to give you a first estimate of the displacement. Green is no displacement. You'll see that here in the middle. The bluer colors would indicate a rising area, the redder colors a subsiding area, which is what we're looking at here. And you can see our subsidence feature pretty clearly defined. Now notice the points are not uniformly distributed. This is all based on what we call persistent scatterers, that is points that persistently scatter in every single image. That's not the case if things are changing. So you'd note, for example, in these agricultural areas where people are plowing, planting, harvesting, that disturbance, uh, it, dis it disables the ability to use persistent scatterers. Similarly, in some of these areas where we see very low density of points, that's probably due to the fact that there's no vegetation and what little water and wind there is is, is moving the surface soil around. And again, we're, we're losing our coherence. So we don't in, get information. Nevertheless, we have a, a quite dense array of points here. Uh, there's no way you could match this sort of density with, with a differential GPS. Now, you, we can, of course, zoom into our data set. You'll see things re-displaying here because, of course, a, a, as we get further in, we can look at each point individually rather than having to average to get them all onto the scene. So you see my picture here is, is updating. Now, as I've said, we, the, the, these red, orange colors are our deep displacement features. The yellows, greens, less so. So one thing of interest, of course, is that this is not a very simple substance feature. It's not just a circular bowl subsiding. In fact, we can see indications here in the red, the extreme subsidence, is probably reflecting the actual subsidence of the ground based on the structure underneath. So we, we may be looking at subsurface uh, rock structure being reflected in the, in the subsidence right here on top. 
But as I say, we have some tools to look at this. Uh, one thing we're going to want to look at is what we call the velocity. How much is this area subsiding? And obviously everything from 0 to 20 is, is, is rising, so changing this to 0 doesn't really change anything at all. But we could say, okay, well, we just want to look at the areas that are subsiding significantly. So let's just set this up to, say, 9. So areas that are subsiding between 9 and 20 centimeters per year, that's all that's displayed here. We've gotten rid of the areas where things are not particularly happening, and we're seeing very strikingly the, the, these arc-shaped uh, subsidence areas that, as I say, probably reflect subsurface structure. And we can see a few random points up here, up in the mountains. I would suspect these are outliers, some sort of noise. But th th this is clearly a subsidence feature, and we know it's there. It's been mapped with GPSs and everything else. Now, another thing we can do is we can set what we call the coherence. In other words, what quality is going to be our cutoff point? Now, our default is 50%. We're saying it's the coherence is between 50 and 100. We'll want to use those. Well, maybe we could say, well, let's, let's take a look at what if we go down to a very low coherence? In other words, points that were not all that stable with time. And then we don't really see a big difference. We picked up a few points. We can see some very dense areas here by lowering our coherence, but no big gain uh, by lowering the quality of uh, points we look at, but it may at some point in time be important. Maybe there are some points in these fields that are important to us for some reason, and, and we do want to use those. Or conversely, we could say, let's just look at the points that are really high quality, you know, 75% or better. Again. We can see there's quite a bit fewer points, much, much less dense in here, so we've definitely winnowed out the lower quality points, but overall, our information is pretty much the same. So let's, let, well, let's just stay with the, with, with, with the high coherence, and then we can change another parameter. We can say, what are, what are the areas that are really, really going fast? Where, where do we have the serious subsidence? Okay, I'm not seeing anything there. There we have a few points. So these are the points that, that are seriously su subsiding there. Just by coming back, yeah, we've got a pretty good layout here, the same, the same structure. And let, let's just zoom in one notch further. And then let's select a few points. Let's take a look at this point right here. That is all the information for that particular point. And every one of these points on this plot is a scene that was acquired for this analysis. So you can see we probably had you know, at least 30 scenes that were used for this analysis. And we have some things we can, we can do with this a little bit. We can, for example, put in a regression line. Just helps us to understand it better. We, we can turn off the noise filter or turn it on. I usually leave, leave it on. It just you know, does a rolling average to straighten the line out a little bit. And the other thing we can do is by moving this plot here, we can change. Let's just say that we're only interested after April. Let's just, say we, let, let's just look at 2016 to 2018. So we can in, inquire more or fewer points depending on what's important to us. For example, there may be some event that took place. Uh, a seasonal rainfall or an abnormal amount of pumping, and, and we want to try to understand why things suddenly happened here. Is this important or is this not important? What is that telling us? And of course, I don't have subsidiary air information to analyze what, the, what it means in this context, but the person who understood and was studying this site would have other information. Now, one thing that we do with a lot of our plots is automatically download rainfall data because that's relevant to a lot of subsidence, landslides and things like that. But in our case here, we had no rainfall, so that's not helping us any. And the other thing we can look at is our SAR amplitude, if for some reason we want to see how bright our return was in, in the context of the analysis we're trying to do. So there's just some subsidiary information there. We could say, okay, well, let's, let's take a look at this point over here instead. Slightly different. Take a look at this point over here. So that's how the tool is used. Quick, easy, but a lot of information for someone who's trying to understand 
an area like this in the context and more importantly or as importantly people who are trying to do mitigation efforts.